Sadie is a PhD candidate at Northwestern, and she's with the Brain, Behavior, and Cognition Area of the Psychology Department, BBC. Good acronym. So besides research, she spends a lot of time working on various science outreach projects. Um, in 2016, she started a podcast, which is creatively titled PH Drinking. So you'll soon be a doctor of PH Drinking, so in which she interviews grad students from a variety of fields about their research and essentially help them to explain ideas, relatively complex ideas to a lay audience like us. And she has also written several articles on sleep research and helped organize both the Chicago and National Com Sign Con. I'm assuming communication science conference. conference. There you go. Um, communication science conference workshop for graduate students. So with that said, Sadie, please welcome. Let's give her a warm hand. It's gonna do do do. Here we go. Um, hi, yeah, so I study sleep and memory, and I'm interested in a lot of other topics, but I get to talk to you guys about what I'm doing my PhD work on, which is very exciting for me. Uh, so I want to start by asking, uh, raise your hand if you got enough sleep last night. Not just eight hours, but enough. Okay, y'all are way better than most of my audiences. <laughs> I normally do this for graduate students or um, like, you know, young kids, and they're like, oh, I got three hours, I had an all-nighter project, and I have to tell them that's not actually good for you. Um, so yeah, it's really difficult for people to get enough sleep, especially in this uh, modern society, but I'm here to explain why sleep is so important, what our brain's doing during sleep, and um, a little bit of like some brain hacking type stuff that my lab is working on right now. So I wanted to start by defining sleep because it's actually incredibly difficult to define. Uh, it's not just a loss of consciousness, otherwise we'd consider a coma or getting knocked out sleep. It um, isn't when you go under anesthesia. My mom's a, a nurse anesthetist, and so she often tells people she's putting them to sleep. Um, but as we know from Michael Jackson's passing a couple years back, that's not sleep, that's a drug-induced coma almost. So the way that scientists define sleep is a naturally occurring state that is periodic and recurring, so it happens again and again, um, and it involves the relaxation of your muscles and the suspension or reduction of consciousness. And it actually turns out that everything that is alive has a period of sleep, from single-celled organisms all the way up to um, whales, trees, everything. Um, in some species, it's called quiescence because they don't completely, they don't have brain waves, so we can't tell that they are asleep, but they have these periods of quiet and rest. So if it's conserved across every single species that's alive on Earth, it must be doing something important. And so that's always my first hint um, that sleep is really interesting. But in general, it's still a very difficult topic to define. So a lot of the early research on sleep focused on sleep deprivation. We know we all sleep, so what happens when we don't sleep? Um, and so this was a way to test, is sleep truly necessary? Uh, <laughs> I really like that image. It's how I feel sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so in sleep deprivation, in animals, we do this in a couple different ways. Um, so there are three main animal models that we use to study sleep deprivation, which is you know, completely not allowing the animal to sleep. The first one is something called a flower pot method. So in this image, you can see there's a white rat, and he's sitting on an upside down flower pot. And the pot is relatively small, and he's surrounded by water. And if you know anything about rat research or mouse research, they hate water. They do not like to be in water. They want to avoid it as much as possible. Um, and so the idea of this method is it's very hard to stay balanced on the flower pot. And as the rat gets drowsy, it might fall off into the water, wakes up, has to climb back up. Um, so that was one of the early methods, very cheap way to do the research in lab. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit stressful for the animal because they're falling in the water all the time. Um, it might also be affecting their body temperature. They're getting cold every time they hit the water. So we can't really say, oh, the effects we see are sleep deprivation. Um, let's try a different model. So this is the idea called the stir bar model. In this, the um, cage has a small bar that's on the ground that is slowly rotating throughout the entire course of the day and night. And so the animal keeps getting nudged by it and has to climb over before it can sit still again. Um, but this method is also a little bit stressful for the animals. 
And so the most common one that the undergraduates hate the most is called gentle handling. This is where you bring in undergraduates to your lab and you make them stay up. <laughs> and they gently hold the animal, and they've been trained in this so that the animal has to stay awake because it's being constantly you know, touched. Um, but it's a little less stressful than things like the flower pot method. But it really sucks to be that student because <laughs> your friends will be like, oh, let's go out. It's Saturday night. You have to say, no, I have to go to the lab from uh, midnight until 4 a.m. I'm holding rats all night. <laughs> OK, buddy. Have fun with that. Um, so those are the, the animal methods that we use. With humans, we have to get a little more tricky. We play games. We um, have them walk around. You can't get them a lot of food. You can't um, expose them too much bright light because those are going to impact what the sleep deprivation looks like. So they're a little more hard. I think actually the gentle handling is probably the easiest method. Um, but in general, when we deprive um, any kind of creature of sleep, these are the general physiological um, aspects you'll see change. So you'll see um, your muscles don't recover as well. So you'll have more achy um, muscles and backs. Uh, it increases your chance of obesity. It turns out when you're sleep deprived, you crave more sugary foods. So then uh, you get obese. Uh, it lowers your immunity response. So sleep deprivation often leads to really weird infections and complications because your immune system is suppressed. It can also increase your risk of diabetes. And then what I care more about is what's going on in the brain. So it can lead to irritability, slowed reaction times, um, reduced fine motor skills. So that's why you really don't want a surgeon who's been staying up all night. Um, you really want to make sure they're uh, cutting the right thing. And uh, what I'm really, really interested in is the um, difficulty encoding and then retrieving memories. Um, so this is all sleep deprivation. This is when you don't sleep at all, all night. Um, the next kind of step to look at is, well, what happens if you're just chronically not quite getting enough sleep? So if you're one of those people who raised your hand, or didn't raise your hand, um, and got sleep last night, but not really enough, um, and an undergraduate at the University of Texas in Austin, I studied chronic sleep restriction. Um, and so what we did is we took a bunch of undergraduates who are in the engineering program because they don't sleep enough, and we followed them throughout the course of a semester. So we used this um, setup right here um, that's on my face. It's called EEG, um, electroencephalography. Basically, we're recording the activity of electrons in your or the uh, neurons in your brain. Um, you can't look at a single neuron, but you can look at when a bunch of neurons all fire together. It creates a spike on the screen, so we can look at brain activity that way. Um, and so we tracked them across the semester, looking at their reaction time and the activity in their brain. And what we found was between the first session to the third session, so first one at the beginning of the semester, third session is 15 weeks later, they had much slower reaction times. So they were about 20 seconds lower on average. Some people were much slower. Some people fell asleep during the task at the third session, so they were minutes slow. Um, and they had a lot more lapses. Lapses are when the target appears on screen and you are not paying attention and you totally forget to click. Um, and so we found this like huge reduction. And I want to note that on average, the amount of lessened sleep they got was about a half hour. So they started the semester at about, on average, seven hours and they ended around six and a half to six hours, 20 minutes. And we saw a marked difference. Um, so they were both slower and they had a lot more misses on this task, which can be really dangerous um, if you are doing a high intensity um, job or you're an overnight truck driver or something like that. Um, and when we recorded from the brain, we saw that basically during wake, their brain looked like it was asleep. So the activity um, had the same kind of rhythms that we would expect when someone's asleep. So that was kind of our first hint that even sleep restriction, even just not getting quite enough is bad. And then there's a third kind of sleep disruption that I always think is important to talk about, which is shift work. So as I was saying, truck drivers, um, barge drivers, some people when they're in medical school during residency, uh, it's basically when you have your um, sleep is off of the natural circadian rhythms. So you're not going to bed when it gets dark and waking up when it's light. Um, you have to work weird hours. Sometimes they shift from week to week. And so this can um, lead to increased nodding off, um, much higher incidence of rate, uh, rate of errors and accidents, and um, much greater risk of chronic disease. So there's actually been some really cool research going on now looking at specifically truck drivers and um, barge drivers uh, to see if you can help them shift their sleep into a more appropriate time, even based on their shift work, so that we have less errors. Um, a couple of years ago, you guys might remember that like two of the Navy ships ran into each other. Part of that, we think, was due to this um, shift work sleep deprivation, that they weren't getting regular sleep and that their schedules were all out of whack and they couldn't pay attention very well. 
So this is all doom and gloom. I'm really sorry, guys. You should sleep, not to stress you out. Um, but there are ways to make your sleep better, which is always helpful. So um, some better sleep practices that I think are really easy to implement, and I have tried to implement them in my own life as much as possible. Um, first of all, removing blue light exposure before bread. So there's this tiny chunk in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. We just call it SCN because acronyms are easier. And um, this chunk of your brain gets a direct signal from your eyes, and it's looking for a specific wavelength. It's looking for blue light. So this chunk of your brain sets your circadian rhythm, sets your natural sleepy periods and wake periods based on the blue light that's coming from your eyes. Because in nature, the only blue light we get is from the sun. So when the sun's out, you want to be awake. When the sun goes down, you want to go to sleep. Unfortunately, modern technology, uh, our screens use a lot of blue light in the projection of the light. And so it can lead to watching a movie at 10 o'clock, trying to go to bed afterwards, and feeling really awake like it's midday. Um, but a lot of computers have these things called like night shift, or there's an app you can get for Android called Flux. And basically, you set the time, your, your time zone, and it will start to fade out the blue light in your computer screen so that everything will look kind of orangey. It'll kind of throw you off if you're like a designer or something. But it's really helpful um, in being able to go to sleep right after staring at a screen. Another way that you can help your sleep is keep a consistent sleep schedule. Um, I know for students, and sometimes myself included, it's hard to get up on the weekends. But the more consistent that you go to bed and wake up at relatively the same time, the easier it is for your body to be in that habit. And so it doesn't um, shift your, your circadian rhythm around in a way that's bad for you. Um, and then this one, which I kind of like to call the uh, sterile cockpit theory. Um, sterile cockpit is when you're in an airplane, you don't want a bunch of distractions, you want to be paying attention to what's going on at all times. Um, the same kind of goes for your bedroom. Your bedroom should really just be about sleep. Um, so if you can't fall asleep, get out of bed. Go sit in a chair, go do some light reading. Um, if you're laying in bed anxious about the fact that you can't go to sleep, you now start to associate your bed with that anxiety and that inability to sleep. And so every time you go to bed, you're like, it's tonight the night I never sleep. And it's really bad for you. <laughs> um, so the idea is that you get up and you do something very restful and calming. And when you start to feel drowsy, go back to bed. And keep your bedroom separate. Don't you know? try to watch a bunch of TV in bed as much as you can. Um, but yeah, and a few other just general tips that I find helpful. Avoid caffeine in the afternoon or evening. Um, like I said, that was the sterile cockpit hypothesis. Uh, establish bedtime routines that help you relax and unwind. I write in a journal every night before I go to bed, so I'm not looking at a screen, and I find that's really relaxing and helpful for me. Um, keep the bedroom a slightly cooler temperature. There's some really cool research recently on um, tribes that don't have access to modern technology and light. And it turns out that more than when the sun rises and sets, what was setting their sleep schedules was the temperature. So it tends to be really cool when you go to bed, like as it starts to cool off throughout the night. And when it starts to warm up, it warms up a little bit before the sun rises. And people are waking up with that natural inclination. So if you keep your bedroom cooler, it helps a bit. And then exercise regularly, eat healthy, all the boring things everyone knows. Less interesting. Um, so moving on, let's talk about like what sleep actually looks like. Um, there's two main drivers of sleep that, that help you fall asleep and wake up. So on this graph, um, across the bottom, you can see the hours of the day. Um, and so the ones in black are night, the ones in white are day, noon is in the center. Um, and so there are these two drivers of sleep. Um, one is called the homeostatic driver. And homeostasis is just this desire uh, to return to equilibrium, to be balanced. So that's the blue one. Basically, if you wake up at about 6, you have no desire for sleep because you just slept. And then the longer you're awake, the more this sleep pressure builds, as we call it, um, until you go to sleep. And then it starts to alleviate and go away. And you can see this actually in um, changes in cortisol in your stress hormones. That's how we can kind of track that sleep need. Uh, the second driver of sleep is uh, the circadian driver. So I've been talking about circadian a lot. Circadian just refers to circadian, about a day. Um, your body has its own internal clock that sets itself at about a day. It's actually about a half hour short. So if you were in constant darkness, you would be waking up a half hour early every day because your clock is a little short, and so it has to be set using light. Um, but that circadian clock actually has its own natural peaks and troughs. And that's why you can see on this graph around 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, you see this bump in the red line. That's, you know, that's siesta time. Uh, it turns out our clock is not perfectly set, and it has kind of two big bumps, one in the middle of the night when we should be asleep, and then one in the afternoon when I would ideally like to be asleep. 
Um, so those are the main drivers of sleep. And there, you can, you can follow the circadian rhythms looking at melatonin. Um, you can see it in adenosine, which is part of this uh, biological uh, process that we can measure. And so this is what we found that is driving sleep, is leading us to want to go to sleep. But not all sleep looks the same. It might seem like when you conk out, you're done. Unless you're in dreaming, it seems like you're just not there. Uh, it turns out when we're looking at your brain, that's not true. There's a lot of really cool little stuff going on during sleep. And this is what I do, is I watch people sleep in my lab. That's my job. It's great. <laughs> Um, so we have sleep that's been broken up into different stages, um, light sleep and dark sleep, uh, or deep sleep, and then also REM sleep. So it looks like this on an average night. When you first start to fall asleep, you go through something we call stage one. It's this really light sleep. You might see some um, muscle activity start to slow down. There'll be occasional muscle twitching. If you've ever watched your dog or cat start to fall asleep, you can kind of see their <coughs> paws starting to twitch. Um, that's that stage one sleep. Um, your brain has these natural rhythms that are based on the, the frequency of their oscillations. So that's all the neurons firing together, going quiet, firing, going quiet. Um, and when you're in stage one sleep, you're starting to get into what's called alpha sleep. So the pattern is about 8 to 12 hertz. Um, all the brain's kind of firing in this meditative slowing down process. It's starting to move towards a slower rhythm called theta. Um, you also get these really cool things called hypnic jerks. So raise your hand if you've ever been falling asleep and then you feel like you're falling, you jerk up. Yeah, that's a, that's a hypnic jerk or a hypnagogic jerk. Um, we don't really know what causes those, by the way. We know they happen. We have evidence. Um, there's one researcher at the University of Colorado who thinks that it was a leftover evolutionary thing of when we were sleeping in trees. If you had the sensation of falling, you better wake up because you're in trouble. Um, and so they think that maybe it's a leftover evolutionary bit, but we don't actually know. Um, the other thing, the reason I have this beautiful image of Tetris, is this one we have something called the Tetris effect, which is um, if you've played Tetris a lot before going to bed, when you close your eyes, and stage one is when you see those falling pieces, but like you're still playing Tetris, or if you've been like in the ocean for a long time and you've been constantly buffeted by waves, stage one is when you close your eyes and you feel like you're still kind of in the waves of the, of the water. Um, so those are the cool things happening in stage one. But as you move into a deeper stage of sleep, you go into stage two. Um, during this period, your breathing pattern and your heart rate are starting to slow down. Uh, there's a decrease in your core body temperature. Um, and if you're me and you're watching someone's brain, the way that we can tell you're in stage two is these two key um, little oscillations. First one's called a sleep spindle. It's this fast burst of activity. Um, we think it's one part of the brain talking to another part and kind of coordinating between them. Uh, we think it's between the thalamus and the cortex. Um, and then there are these things called K-complexes. They were originally discovered because someone accidentally knocked <laughs> on some wood while someone was sleeping, and it elicited a K-complex. So we, someone knocked, and then we saw this big spike. And so some people think a K-complex is to help your brain stay asleep. It's kind of um, the brain reacting to a sound going, shh, no, 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 we need this. Um, there's also some evidence it has to do with cognition, something about memory maybe, but sleep research in terms of this kind of stuff is actually maybe 20 years old, maybe 15 years old. Um, so a lot of this is really unknown. Moving into deeper sleep, we get into stage three and four. Um, in American um, like medical standards and American research standards, three and four, we just put them together. We call them slow wave sleep because your brain is making big, slow waves. That's it, really clever. Um, basically, all of the cortex, all of the outside of your brain is firing at the same time and going quiet at the same time and firing at the same time. So it's like everything is in sync. Um, this is when you, they're called delta waves often, this is when you have very um, deep, slow breathing, your body core temperature is even slower. Um, it's really hard to wake people up from this period of sleep, you really kind of have to rouse them. And then the last period of sleep is stage five or REM sleep, which um, most everyone knows is rapid eye movement. This is when most dreams tend to happen, although um, you can actually dream not during REM and you can have REM without dreams. They're just, they tend to occur together, but not guaranteed to. Um, so this is, your muscles should be still relaxed unless you have a sleep disorder and you're you know, getting up and walking around, um, but your eyes will be twitching and moving around as if you're looking at a scene. Um, so what does it look like from my point of view as a researcher? I don't, get, I don't have this pretty graph when I'm doing my research. Instead, <laughs> I'm looking at this mess. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so <laughs> this is um, just kind of a quick example of what the data actually looks like that sleep researchers have to interpret. Um, during wake, all the blue lines are um, electrodes that we have on the scalp. So they're going down the center line of the scalp. 
The black line is muscle activity. So this is how we can tell if you're starting to relax your muscles. We usually put it on the chin. And then the two red lines are um, on your eyes. So one's below an eye and one is beside an eye. And the idea is that we can then see eye movements. So when someone is awake and they have their eyes open, you have all this fast activity, it looks really noisy. Um, as they start to close their eyes, you get something, like I said, alpha, which is kind of this meditative starting to fall asleep. There's a little box around the alpha. You can see that it's very um, clear. It's very, like, scritchy. I don't know how to, to explain it. It's very hard to teach people to spot these things sometimes. Um, as you start to go stage one, you see the disappearance of that alpha. You see less and less of it, and you start to see these big, slow um, eye movements. It's like the eyes are rolling in their sockets, basically. And so when you see someone doing that in your task and they're not supposed to be asleep, you have to kind of go in and be like, hey, you awake? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure you were. Uh, we can tell. <laughs> so that's stage one. And then as you start to move to stage two, as I said, you'll see these K-complexes. And often you'll see a spindle that follows a K-complex. So the, the spindles are a little harder to spot, but the K-complexes are pretty big and pretty obvious. Um, as you can see, the muscle line, the black line, is starting to get thinner and thinner because your muscles are relaxing, and so you're getting less activity there. Um, then you get into stage three, which is slow waves. So you get these big, slow waves. It's really clear when you've hit good slow wave sleep. Um, so you'll see these big, like, 75 microvolt um, changes. That's the easiest one when you have an undergrad that you're teaching them how to, what we call sleep score, how to identify sleep stages. They're like, that one sleep, that's slow wave. And you're like, yes, that's the easy one. You got it. Um, and then the hardest one, unfortunately, is REM sleep. Um, so you'll see these fast oscillations in the brain that kind of looks like wake, but the muscle is like almost gone. Um, but the key is these eye twitches. So those little sharp jags are where someone has like changed their eye position, and that's how you can tell when you're seeing REM. But like I said, there's no, there's no muscle. Um, so all these stages of sleep, you actually go through them multiple times in a cycle. And so over the course of a night, it'll look something like this, where you start and wake, then you drop to stage one, then stage two, stage three, or slow wave, and you stay in slow wave a lot during the first half of the night. And then as you get towards the second half of the night, you spend less time in this deep sleep and more time in REM sleep. And this is often why you can remember your dreams, um, if you can remember them, as you woke up near that REM sleep period. So if you wake up when you were recently dreaming, it's much easier to remember. So yeah, that's about what it should look like if you get seven hours of sleep. You go through about six-ish cycles, um, but it can vary a lot by individuals. So that's like all the basics of sleep. That's all the stuff that I do. I just stare at people sleeping in my lab. It's real exciting. But um, what I really care about is not just sleep, but what's going on in your brain during sleep? How does it relate to memory and memory consolidation? Um, so what is memory consolidation? That's like a really weird jargony science term. Basically what it means is during the day, you take in a bunch of information. Consolidation is you sorting that information and keeping it in a structured way that you can later access. So it would be like if throughout the day um, you were collecting a bunch of photos, and then that evening you were sorting through them and organizing them so the next day you could show your friends the photos. That's consolidation. Um, and it turns out the brain's doing a lot of consolidating during sleep. So the first study that really kind of hinted at this was not just that if you don't sleep, it's bad for you, but that sleep was boosting something. Uh, was done by this researcher named Matt Walker over at UC Berkeley. So he had this really simple task. He had people come in at either 10 a.m. or 10 p.m., and he had them learn this, like, goofy finger-tapping task. It was you used four fingers, and you had a sequence, and you had to tap it as many times as you could, um, as quickly as you could within a period of time, and you had to be accurate but fast. So you, he teaches them this task, and then they have a 12-hour gap. And now if you came in at 10 a.m., that means your 12 hours are over the course of a day. If you came in at 10 p.m., that meant the 12 hours was over the course of the night, and you'd come back in the next morning. So then he tested them then, and then he gave them another 12 hours and, had, and tested them again. So that's why you have either your 10 a.m., 10 p.m., 10 a.m., or vice versa. And he wanted to see if people got faster or more accurate. Um, so I'm going to kind of like walk through this graph a little slowly, because I know that staring at a bunch of colored bars, if you haven't been doing it for the last five years, it's kind of hard. Um, so I tried to break this down a bit. Basically, when the person first comes in, um, we look at the motor learning. And so this is the speed. How many sequences do they get per second? So higher, um, higher speed is better. Um, so post-training, at that first um, time they came in, they do OK. They're you know, getting about 23 se sequences within that um, set of time. 
Then they come in again. So this is the uh, wake group. So they came in at 10 a.m. They come back in at 10 p.m. They've gotten a little better. They're doing better. This is the retest at, in the evening. Um, then they get to go home and sleep. That's what that purple bar is. Well, now when they wake up, whoa, they're suddenly way better. And it's not just the fact that they were um, they had all this time. Because if you look at the other group, so this is the group that came in at 10 p.m. and then 10 a.m. again, you can see after sleep there's this massive boost. So people are being a, a lot more fast after a period of sleep. And it's not just a period of 12-hour delay. Um, uh, the same can be said, this is uh, kind of the inverse. This is the error rate, so lower bar is better because um, you're making less errors. Only after sleep do you see this massively reduced amount of errors. So something is getting better in the brain. Something is getting better organized. In this particular study, um, you saw that speed and accuracy only got better after a period of sleep. And um, when they've done some follow-up work, they've found that it's probably due to REM activity, there's some evidence that the different stages of sleep are useful for different things. So REM sleep is really best for emotional consolidation. You see this with little kids. Um, if a, a kid has a traumatic experience and they take a nap and they get REM, they tend to uh, have less emotional reaction to that thing, but will remember it really well. Um, and it has to do with motor learning, so learning to swing a bat or putt or something like that. Um, more REM is going to be better for that. But slow wave sleep is a little different. Slow wave seems to be doing something more basic about our memories and consolidating um, declarative memories, which are things that you can declare. So facts and figures and events that you remember. So this is really what my lab does. We're, we're trying to brainwash people. No. Um, <laughs> I realized that this is the best um, sci-fi reference I have for the research I do and also the most negatively connotated one. So if you've ever read Brave New Worlds uh, by Aldous Huxley, you know that there's this portion in the book where he talks about going to bed and there's like a, a speaker underneath the bed that's quietly whispering things to the person while they sleep. Um, I think in this case it was based on whether you were an alpha or a beta in your society, it was reinforcing those societal levels essentially. Um, and so that you were like, brainwashed into buying into your social status. And it turns out my Uncle Dorsey <laughs> Um, tried to do this to my mom when she was a kid, when they were both kids. He, he didn't quite try to brainwash her, but he recorded him reading uh, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe and hit a tape recorder under her bed when she was a kid. And she was like, it was the scariest thing. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and there's someone talking about a raven. Really freaked her out. But she still remembers parts of it. I'm kind of surprised. Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of the closest to what my lab does. But we're not actually brainwashing people. Um, and it's, it's not that simple, unfortunately. Um, so the classic study of my lab, of what, this method that we call targeted memory reactivation, is a really simple uh, spatial task. So you get this big grid, it's like a chessboard, and images appear at different locations on the grid. So you'll see one image at a time. So you'll see the cat in that lower corner, and every time the cat appears there, you hear meow. Um, and then the next one, you might see the tea kettle, you'll hear uh, the sound like of a tea kettle whistle. Uh, you might see a champagne glass and hear the sound of someone cheersing. So there's 50 items like this. Um, and so we, they all appear in these different locations. Then we let you practice putting them in those locations. So we'll put that item in the center of the grid, and you use your mouse, and you move the item to where you think it should go on that grid. And then you get feedback, and it'll say, like, oh, you were off by, you know, like, one inch, or you were dead on, good job. So you go through and you learn all of these items equally well, and then we pick half of the items that are already um, selected so that you're done equally well on group A compared to group B. So in this case, we grab the cat and the tea kettle you're equally good at, so we put them in two different groups. And that's why you can see on this graph that the mean error, so how accurate people are, is like identical. Now what we do is we have you take a nap in our lab. And when you're taking this nap, we wait until you're in the slow wave period of sleep. So this is the deep period of sleep when all your brain is firing and going quiet together. And embedded in white noise, we play half of those sounds. So in this case, in case we chose to play the cat sound. So you're hearing meow embedded into white noise. Um, and since we're watching people's brains, we know they're not waking up, we can tell. Because um, if they start to wake up, you got to stop those noises. Otherwise, they'll, they'll come to you after the study and be like, I swear, I was hearing some weird things in my dreams. Um, so we play these sounds. We, we play them all just once. Um, and then they wake up from their nap 90 minutes later. So then we test them again, and we say, OK, tell us where these objects go. We're going to test you on all the objects. Well, it turns out that if you hear the sound cue associated with that object during sleep, 
you're way better at it than the ones you didn't hear. Um, so it's a consistent but small difference. It's about, um, I think it's like 25 centimeters better, or something like that. It's not a whole lot based on the size of the grid. But when you hear that sound during sleep, your brain is going, oh, yeah, 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 that was that game where I had to place it. It went here. And so it's practicing that activity, essentially. So when you wake up, you're better at the ones you've practiced for free during sleep than the ones you didn't practice. Um, right now, though, it's, it, this study came out in... 2009, and there was one paper that used uh, olfactory, so they used the scent of rose odor to help train people. That was done in like 07. So this is brand new research um, that we're still trying to kind of define the boundaries. Does this only work for some things and not others? Uh, one study that I thought was just really clever um, was done in 2014, and they were trying to teach people or help people quit smoking. So what they would do is they would take this... Um, aversive odor, they would, they would play them two different odors. So one was like the smell of rotting eggs and the other one's rotting fish. And they say, which one's grosser to you? Um, and, you'd, and you'd pick the grosser smell. And then what they do is they would ask you your habitual smoking use. So that's this uh, timeline at the top shows habitual smoking use. Then you keep a, a seven day diary of how much did you smoke each day on those seven days. Um, they ask you which odor's grossest, you tell them. Then during sleep, um, they have you sleep in the lab, and they will um, play the smell of your personal grossest odor mixed with the smell of cigarette smoke. Um, and so this doesn't wake people up again. Um, sometimes they would just smell, like, just play the gross odor so they wouldn't have a control group. You know, is it just that it's like you're smelling something gross and so you feel nauseous and you don't want to smoke anymore, or is it something about the gross odor now associated with the smell of cigarette smoke. So they play that gross smell, you wake up, they make you rank the smells again, basically like, hey, is rotten fish still gross to you? And you're like, yup, still gross. Um, and then they have you do another seven day smoking diary. And I just want to show um, below the timeline, you can see kind of what the olfactometer looks like. It's real complicated. This is why my lab prefers to do uh, sounds in our studies rather than smell. You have to wear these crazy masks. They're kind of a pain to put on. Um, you, the problem with smell also is that it tends to linger. So you have to be able to, to clear that smell if it looks like someone's about to wake up. Sounds are a lot easier to control. But in this study, they were really trying to associate this intrinsic disgust with the um, smoking. And in fact, what they found is consistently across all seven days, the black bars are people who got the nasty odor mixed with the smoke, and the um, gray bars are the ones where they only got the nasty odor not mixed with the smell of smoke. And what you see is they were consistently smoking less cigarettes across a seven-day period. And what I think is really cool about the studies, first of all, what a great trick. If you don't like your mom smoking, just like slip some rotten eggs underneath her bed, she'll stop. No, uh, <laughs> I wish. But what I find really cool about this is that this was an overnight design. So it was over a full period of sleep rather than just a nap. And they were able to track it up to a full week. Uh, one of the problems in science, especially human research, is it's hard to get people to consistently come back in for later follow-ups. So you know, scientists might be like, we discovered that uh, chocolate helps you sleep better. And then if you look at the study, um, that's for one night, and you look 10 weeks out, and it's like, oh, actually, it made no difference. It's a really small effect that only lasts for a short time. This is cool because it lasted for a whole week. Um, so I thought that was a really neat, interesting use. Um, but then the other kind of like funner version, more fun version, uh, is like learning how to play an instrument. So in this study, it's very much, oh, raise your hand if you know what Guitar Hero is. That's like the simplest way. OK, awesome. So like Guitar Hero, um, it's this game where these buttons are moving up into these circles, and you want to click whenever the circle hits that button. So it's a four finger um, melody, essentially. It would be similar as if you were playing on a piano. And so you learn uh, a couple different sequences. You either learn um, the high pitch, uh, you learn the high pitch, the low pitch, and the bass line is at post-test. So you learn these two different songs. You learn them equally well. Um, each one, because you're playing kind of this song game, you're hearing the melody as you're, lear as you're playing. And then we, take a nap. we have you take a nap, and we play one of those melodies. Once again, embedded in white noise. The white noise is there so people fall asleep hearing sounds and that a sudden sound doesn't wake them up. And then we like, kind of hide the melody within it. Um, and so when they wake up, it turns out that you are much better at the cued song than the uncued. So this first graph, I should have this, broke this down as well. The first graph shows before sleep, the red and um, blue should be identical because you learn them equally well. The reason the green is so low is because that's the bass line. That's like a totally new melody that you've never practiced before. So that's like bass skill. So when you practice the difference between the green and the red and the blue, that's how much you gain through practice. On the second graph, you can see 
how much you gain with practice, and then sleep with cueing. So the red one, you slept on it, so you got better, but you weren't cued. The blue one was cued, and so you got even better. So you're better at playing this melody when you both sleep, but then also when you hear those sounds associated with your learning during sleep. Um, at this point, I want to point out, it's really important to know that you have to have learned something in order for it to have gotten better. Um, if you tried to play a whole new song that you had not practiced, but you had heard during sleep, you won't be better at it. So some people, uh, after my talks, will come up and say, oh, I'm going to learn a foreign language. I'm just going to play Russian while I sleep. And I'm like, <laughs> if your brain doesn't know what the Russian is associated with, it can't help you. The whole thing is your brain playing this game of, oh yeah, I remember that bit, let me connect it to the other things and practicing those connections. If there's nothing that it's connecting to, you won't be able to get better. So we can't actually brainwash people, sad say, but uh, unless you taught them ahead of time, <laughs> you are a beta and then you make them listen to beta. Um, but it's really hard and they, people have to be motivated to do this. Uh, if people are uninterested in what they're learning, the effect gets a lot smaller, it almost disappears. So not quite brainwashing, but good for practicing your memories. Um, so in terms of my personal research, uh, these are all studies that we've done in the past. I'm working on something that I think is an interesting twist on this type of thing. So I'm really interested in this idea of memory specificity versus memory generalization. And I kind of think of it this way. Uh, memory specificity is if you can remember exactly what you wore yesterday, who you talked to, what you ate for breakfast. Um, these can be good things to tell people if they're, you know, you're being questioned for a crime and they're like, where were you at 10 a.m.? Oh, I know that I was on the bus because I remember seeing blah, blah, and the clock and this and that. Uh, memory generalization, on the other hand, is where you don't remember the specifics of a, of a memory, but you have a lot of overlapping memories that then create a schema that's useful for a new situation. So for example, you always park in the same parking lot every morning when you go to work, but you one morning you show up at 8 and you're able to get a really good spot closer to the door, and another morning you show up at 8.15 and now you end up out on the street, and at 8.40 for some reason there's a spot open but it's like in the middle of the lot. You start to um, put all those memories together and you realize, based on what time I show up, I know where I should be looking for a parking spot because I have all these overlapping experiences that I've abstracted some information. Um, so the reason I have a painting up here is because I do a painting study. Um, basically, I teach people a bunch of paintings. Um, so these are all a bunch of Manets, and they're all beautiful, and you can kind of see they have all these similarities. And then I show them a new painting by a different painter, but in the same art style, so this is Cezanne. Um, and the idea is, can you tell that those first three all generalize to one artist's style, versus can you tell when this new one is something totally new and doesn't belong in that grouping? Um, so I'm basically trying to test if I play sounds during sleep, are you going to be using those sounds to remember this one painting? Or are you going to be generalizing across these three and being able to just recognize new paintings by that artist? So what, how is your memory being um, advanced during sleep using these sound cues? Um, so yeah, I think it's really fun. Um, mostly because my study is all beautiful paintings and it's way more interesting than a lot of other tasks I've seen. Um, but another really cool side research program that we've been doing is lucid dreaming. So raise your hand if you know what lucid dreaming is. Awesome. Uh, for those of you who don't know, lucid dreaming is when you're in a dream and you realize you're in a dream. Uh, oftentimes you can actually then manipulate the dream. You can say, oh, I've decided I can fly now. And then you can fly, and it's great. Um, so it turns out that we might be able to train people to lucid dream using these sound cues. So what we do is during the day, we train people that whenever they hear this specific like bell gong, they should, um, for example, look at your hand. Because in dreams, often if you look at your hand, something will look weird. Or if you try to look at, um, like read a book, or look at the time, it won't make any sense. Um, so we teach you to do these habitual things of, you know, check your hand when you hear that bell gong. Then you come in, you take a nap in our lab. This time we're um, playing the sounds during REM sleep because that's when you're most likely dreaming. Um, we play that sound and see if we can get you to do that check. And the cool thing about lucid dreaming is we can actually tell if it works. Um, like I said, your body is paralyzed during REM sleep, but your eyes are still moving. And so we teach people, if you realize you're in a, uh, a lucid dream, move your eyes left, right, left. And it creates this really clear signal. It looks like these big zigzags on the eye channels. And so we can actually see when people are in lucid dreams. And the idea is, if we can train people to do this more consistently, we might be able to then ask people simple yes, no questions about their dreams while they're dreaming. 
So, you know, move your eyes twice for no, three times for a yes. Um, are you flying right now? Oh, they said no. Are you swimming right now? Can you breathe underwater? So we can start to kind of interrogate these lucid dreams as they're happening, which I just think is super weird and cool. Um, unfortunately, that research is really hard because when you, wake, when you play sounds during REM sleep, people tend to wake up really easily. So it's a lot of showing up at lab at, you know, three or four in the morning, trying to get people to go to sleep, and then hoping you don't wake them up when you play those sounds. So that's still ongoing research. We haven't quite worked out all the kinks, but we're getting there. Um, so yeah, those are some of the cool projects that we're doing right now, but I'm happy to now open up to general questions about sleep about science communication, whatever you guys want to talk about. So thank you. Hi. Hi. When, um, why do we fall asleep when we're really bored? Whereas if something else was happening, we wouldn't be falling asleep. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, part of it has to do with the time of day, so you tend to be bored at certain times that are also when we're having that circadian drop, essentially. Um, but also, this like gets really um, into some deep questions of what it means to be awake and alert. Um, so like, brain activity changes depending on what situation you're in. When you're in a high stress situation, your brain's gonna look very different than when you're meditating, than when you're driving, then. Um, and so there's this really interesting um, thinker slash researcher named Gregory Buzaki, and he's written a really cool book about maybe sleep is just when we're bored, but also our body needs to recover. Um, and, and so we, like, there's not really a good clean answer I can give you, <laughs> clearly. Um, but there's, it's, it's really hard to know why that happens exactly, but it's probably something to do with when you're bored, default is take a little nap because you probably need it anyways. <laughs> uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, so I actually also study memory at Northwestern, so I'm going to hit you with a hard question. Sorry. Oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one of the things I'm really interested in is uh, retrieval-induced forgetting. So if you train someone a list of words and then they practice some of the words on the list, they'll actually forget the other words in the list at the, at, at the expense of learning those words. Yes. So I'm wondering if that happens when you do this kind of sleep training. Yeah, so um, I'm actually really glad you asked this. One of the postdocs in my lab, so a postdoc is someone that got their PhD but is working in someone's lab to develop skills before they start their own lab, uh, named Eitan is really interested in directed forgetting and um, this kind of question of sleep's good for memory, but like, wouldn't it be awful if you remembered everything all the time? Forgetting must be important. How does forgetting work with sleep? And he's actually doing some retrieval-induced forgetting studies right now, um, trying to understand and, and whether cueing plays into that. Can you cue things that you're trying to get people to forget that they didn't practice? Um, so like, I'll have an answer for you in about a year. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good morning. It seems there is all this focus on how much we can get more out of the brain while it's, well, for free. And, and uh, I'm just wondering if there's any concern about that cutting into the productivity of the brain then while it's awake instead. Yeah, yeah. Cost. So basically, you get nothing for free is the idea that if you're doing work during sleep, maybe your sleep is not as restful, maybe something else is suffering. If I'm, if I'm practicing guitar here during sleep, uh, does that make my memories of something that happened during the day suffer? The question, the, that's a really good question and a really hard one to address, and the truth is we don't know. Um, like I said, a lot of these studies are very new, and it's hard to tell if kind of doing these, these brain hacks essentially is causing something else to suffer, um, if maybe rather than making it suffer, it turns out you need more sleep if you're gonna be practicing during sleep because um, there's some other biological things going on during sleep. Uh, yeah, the truth is we don't know. There's not been enough work on it. If you want to study it, though, we've got PhDs available. <laughs> Come join. <laughs> right now, I'm in the process of learning a second language. And so you hinted at this a little bit, but if, is there anything you could take from the research you know about what, would, what <coughs> could uh, a good enhancement program for learning a second language look like in terms of sleep and things that happen while you're asleep? Yeah, um, so once again, we have so many ongoing studies. Um, 
first of all, I want to address the question of what it means to learn a foreign language. So there's this idea of, you know, you learn that um, the word for um, happy is wesoły in Polish. Cool, you know, one-to-one -one correlation. That's one kind of knowledge versus understanding grammatical forms or how sentences should be structured. Um, so there is some evidence. There's this whole field called statistical learning that basically talks about whether you can identify patterns, especially patterns in language, and then reproduce those patterns. We have seen that um, playing sound cues during sleep associate with those patterns. We can, we can get your grammar better. Um, learning foreign language words is actually still kind of a toss-up. There's some studies that say yes. There's some studies that say yes, but only if you play a sound cue after a sleep spindle. Um, if you don't play it after a spindle, that word doesn't seem to get better. And so, like. My lab's currently doing another study on foreign language words with like check and finish, I think. Um, and so we're in the middle of collecting data. <laughs> um, thank you for your talk. I'm curious to know when you were creating, this is a doctoral uh, work that you're doing right now for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, is there a larger context that this study will help forward some knowledge about sleep? Yeah, so, so my specific doctoral work is actually the paint study that I covered at the very end. Everything else has already been published and done, and I don't get to claim credit for it, unfortunately. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in these ideas of what it means to have good memory and whether sleep is helping all types of memory. And I think this can be useful for things like disease states where, um, you know, uh, examples like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's have weird sleep disorders. A lot of, almost every mental disorder has um, associated sleep problems. And it's not clear, is this sleep problem kind of making the mental disorder worse or vice versa? And so I think kind of getting at some of these basic memory questions could help answer some questions about what different diseases are doing to the brain. But yeah, it's also just work I really want to do. <laughs> Yes, I'm interested in uh, the research that's being done in connection with musical instruments. Now, if, if I'm learning a piece on the guitar, are you talking about remembering where just physically uh, where the, the notes are on the instrument, or am I training my ear? I, I would rather be able to hear it and reproduce it rather than just mechanically know mm -hmm. that I'm moving my hand up and down the guitar. So what am I doing by this uh, reinforcement? Yeah, so I mean in sleep, in, in normal sleep, you're probably practicing both um, because you need both and both get better after sleep. Um, your ear can get sharper at recognizing when you're hearing an E versus an E flat or something like that. But in terms of the cueing, like I said, there's like there's probably, I had to do my qualification exams on this, and I think there are maybe like 20 studies that do the sleep cueing stuff that's been published. There's a bunch of unpublished work that we haven't vetted through a scientific process yet. Um, so I can't answer that question totally, but I would, if I were to hazard a guess, I would say it probably depends on what you're associating the cue with. Are you just doing the motor, you're not listening at all, and, that's your, and, and you're listening to something else, and that's your cue, or are you practicing um, the sounds and identifying the sounds, then that's, that would probably be the link that gets strengthened. So it probably depends on how, how you're associating things in your brain, honestly. That's my best guess. I may not remember the right word. <laughs> Was it consolidated memory where you take your days and it dumps it? Yep. How can I control that better? <laughs> <laughs> Truly, the question we all want to know. Um, yeah, memory consolidation is a normal process. You can be better at it. You, you get better at all things with, with practice and with good habits. Um, so oftentimes, this is often why I journal at night, is that I can uh, kind of go through what I've done throughout the day, and it helps prep, prep my brain to consolidate those. It turns out um, that if you study information right before you go to bed, that will be increased more than things that were happening earlier in the day. It's not clear. So, so if, you if you're learning a foreign language, if you practice in the morning and then sleep later that night, you won't get as much benefit as if you practice right before bed. So it seems to be whatever you do right before bed is kind of on the top of your mind and gets an additional boost somehow. Oh, you want to dump it all. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> more research. Yeah, more research. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm interested in how you select your subjects. Is it primarily college students uh, uh, at between a certain age, and is it broken down by gender and the sample size? 
Yeah, of course. Those are really good questions. Um, I would. I want to preface by saying psychology has a major problem in how we gather data. Um, it, Honestly, all human research does. We go for what's called a, a, um, a sample of convenience, which means mostly undergrads, mostly local. If they're undergrads at Northwestern, that usually means that they are, you know, upper middle class. They're highly educated. Um, they tend to be highly driven. I've because I've done studies at UT Austin. That's a broader sample. There's like 50,000 undergrads there, and so you get a, a bigger mix of people. And so. Um, yeah, I will say it's mostly undergrads. Uh, we almost always have gender parity. That's usually not a problem, and we don't really see gendered effects. There's one study I saw that said um, men lose slow wave sleep across the lifespan quicker than women. So as you age, you get less slow wave sleep, and men seem to lose it faster than women. But uh, that's like the only gender difference I've seen. But yeah, we're, we're doing almost all young adults. Sample size, uh, yeah, so the cool thing about the, the queued studies is you're your own control. We're comparing the things we didn't queue for you versus things we did compute, uh, queue for you. So our sample size is usually about 30 to 40 people, um, and we can get away with that, but if we were comparing between groups, individual differences are really important, and you gotta like jack up those sample sizes, yeah. Uh, hi, um, quick, quick question, do those blue light glasses, that are becoming more common, do those actually work? Mm -hmm. And also, you you, you and other people have mentioned that naturally we don't, we wouldn't necessarily sleep at, or have a 24 hour day, which just seems so illogical given that we've evolved in a, on a place where the 24 hour day is. So I wonder if you have any comments on that. Yeah, um, so it's, um, first of all, the blue light glasses, I mean, probably some companies make bad ones, but we use sunglasses that take out blue light for our lucid dreamers because they wake up really early and come into the lab and we don't want them getting exposed to a bunch of blue light and then not being able to sleep early in the morning when we need them to nap for our study. Um, so those do seem to work. Uh, and like biologically, it makes total sense why it would work. Uh, in terms of why our schedules are shorter, it's not just humans. Um, the same thing is true for rats and primates and um, most lab animals. Uh, the reason we think that it's short is that it gives you a little bit of leeway to play with um, how the lighting schedule is actually working depending on where you live. So seasons change light um, length essentially and so if your day is a little bit shorter that gives you some leeway to, to reset your clock every day it's like resetting an old timepiece um, rather than if you're exactly on 24 hours if you get messed up a little bit it's harder to reset versus a shorter clock that's the best answer I have for you <laughs> uh, going back to the music studies it looked like the third song the one they hadn't practiced at all mm -hmm. it got better with the cueing in the study Oh, the, the third one that they hadn't, so all three of those songs got a little bit better. The cued one got the most better. You're right, the one that they didn't practice at all got better because sleep makes us better at things, generally speaking. So the, the green, are you talking about the green bar? Yeah, so it, because the, so the green bar was the baseline and they got to play it once before they took a nap and then they played it again later. And anything that you do a second time, um, you tend to be better at. And so it's like, a, um, it's called the testing effect. When you're tested on something, you tend to get better at it. So because you'd already done it once, sleep gave you a little boost, but not nearly as much boost as lots of practice and not nearly as much boost as practice plus cueing, which was the tallest spot. with the third song or something like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh, I, I stumbled here. Not a good start. Uh, the, the, the question I had is, do you consider hypnotism as a subject that is studied in your lab? That's a really interesting question. My lab actually read a paper from another lab two or three years ago that was looking at hypnotism. Um, hypnotism is really hard to study, and uh, what it means to be hypnotized is really difficult. It seems that there are individual differences. For Some, some people can fall into that hypnotic state, and some can't. Um, so my lab doesn't do that because it sounds hard and messy. <laughs> That's the short answer. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I wonder if you have studied or if you have seen any studies on sleep as related to use of prescription or non-prescription sleep medications. Yeah, there's tons of research on that. That stuff tends to sit more in the uh, medical research area than, than what we do. We're considered cl cognition lab, essentially. Um, there is some research on that. Um, the, it depends on the drug, honestly. Some drugs are inducing drowsiness that help you get to sleep better, um, but the sleep tends to look pretty normal. Some drugs are actually kind of 
futzing with the, the um, neurotransmitters in your brain and so your sleep doesn't look quote unquote normal. Um, and we're not sure if that has like long term, like year, you know, years later effects because messing with neurotransmitters is generally not a good idea. Um, but there, man, there was like a paper or two that I saw at a conference a year ago that was looking at drug-induced sleep and then doing sleep cueing, and they found some weird stuff, and I can't remember what they found. I could try to dig that paper up for you, though, um, and, and, and send it to somebody, because th there is some cool research on that, and that's just not my area, so I know very little. Hi, thank you for a, an excellent talk. Um, I'm interested in your art studies that you're doing. Um, in particular, I mean, with the, with the sleeps, uh, sorry, with the, um, Music, so they, they played the music during sleep, and with the smoking cessation, they mixed the smells during sleep. Mm -hmm. And with the cat and the tea kettle one, the sounds were very obviously connected to the objects. But you're talking about using sound cues for the art, is yes. that right? And I'm just interested in, do you train people to associate the sounds, and how do you choose the sounds, and et cetera? Yeah, so um, there was a study done by someone who used to be in my lab and is now at Yale, and he found that if you train people on a sound that's not associated with the image, you can still get that sound cue to work. They just need prior training. So you can hear, you know, clapping associated with a car, and they'll, they'll make that connection. You just have to train them ahead of time. So what I did is I picked the sounds that are most consistently um, audible over the white noise. Some, some sounds, depending on the frequencies, because they're all embedded in white noise, can be hard to hear. They can sound garbled. Uh, if they spike too much, if they're too sharp, then it can wake people up. So I picked sounds that we already had in our library that I knew worked really well. Um, and I associate a sound with the artist's name. So during training, they're seeing a painting, and they have to guess um, who painted it. And so there's six artists, and when they select the artist, they see the correct name of the artist, and they hear the sound of that artist. So like Hawkins is the cat meow. Actually, I stole that one. Um, Schlorf, weird name, sounds like a zipper. And so these sounds are all very distinguishable. And so during sleep, I'll be playing half of the sounds associated with the artist's names. Now, whether associating a sound with an individual painting versus an artist is different, we're trying to study that right now. So maybe when you play a sound for an artist's name, you're going to get more generalization. And when you have a sound per item, it'll get more specificity. Um, that's like a study that right now we're piloting and trying to get set up. I don't know if you can answer this, but I have a friend who I think has post-traumatic stress disorder, and he reports that uh, he has nightmares that cause his heart to race. And I'm just wondering if you know anything about that. Yeah, there's some really cool research going on right now about PTSD and sleep. Um, so like I was saying, in sleep, it turns out that if you have, in normal sleep, if you have a traumatic experience, your brain will reprocess that during normal sleep, usually during REM sleep, um, but it'll kind of disassociate the intense emotional feelings from the things that happened. So if you tell um, a really scary story and a really neutral story to someone, and you measure their, uh, it's called galvanic skin response, it's like how much they sweat. Um, so you'll see that like the, the, the scary story, they'll get kind of stressed out, they'll start sweating. Neutral story is neutral. You have them sleep. When they wake up, um, you ask them to recall details from both of those stories. They'll remember more from the scary story, but they won't have the same stress response. So it's this way of your brain being like, we need to remember the info, but being stressed out about the info is not good evolutionarily, so we dump that. But PTSD, something goes wrong, they don't disconnect, and so you have these really intense emotional um, nightmares and stuff. And there's some work right now trying to even use lucid dreaming to have people take control of their dreams and decrease the emotional stress and see if that can help long term. I had a question for you about the study you're doing on paintings, and I, you, the examples you gave us before were all impressionists, and I'm just wondering sort of the range of painting styles you used and any conversations you had where you thought about sort of the socioeconomic impact or, or uh, connections between, you know, saying looking at graffiti artists versus looking at um, album covers versus looking at impressionists versus, versus looking at modernists and sort of how that would relate to the, the participants in your study and sort of where they come from and, and again, their socioeconomic status. Yeah, totally. No, those are really good questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say that I cheated and I looked at some studies that used artists that were pretty well matched and I said, yeah, I'm going to use those because um, we knew they worked before in, in a, a study done at like, I think it was UCLA. Um, and so they're all um, outdoor pastoral scenes. The idea is you, you don't want it to be too easy for people to learn. Like if we were doing graffiti and outdoor scenes, like you would know who did which. Um, and so they're all supposed to be somewhat confusable. So it's difficult, but not too difficult. Um, and 
uh, all the artists are not well known. Um, we pr specifically screen so that nobody knows who these um, painters are. We also ask if people have any history in art history or are, have any training in art just to see if that's influencing any effects. But um, it's, it's purposely made so that they're all similar-ish, so that it's hard. But I would be really curious to see if we tried with some different type stimuli that, yeah, like graffiti art or something, how that would, um, I think that would impact motivation to learn, would be my guess. I think my study is more interesting than a lot of psych studies. A lot of psych studies are very boring. Um, and this one, at least you're like learning art and that's pretty to stare at versus something really boring to stare at. But I wonder if things that are more engaging would increase memory beforehand and then if sleep would additionally boost that or just same amount of boost, I, I don't know. It's a good question. Hello. What are all of the terrible things that happen to our brains when we are sleep deprived? Oh man, it's so bad. Don't do that. Um, yeah, so I can, like two things that come to mind offhand. First of all, there's this, um, there was a study that came out a couple years ago that was really cool that found during sleep your brain tissue shrinks a little bit and there, um, rather than the lymph nodes in your body, that's kind of your immune system, there's a glymphatic system, slightly different because the blood brain barrier. Um, and what they found is the brain tissue shrinks a little bit during sleep and that system expands a little bit and the argument is you're probably clearing out cellular debris from the day. So just like when you work out and you build up lactic, muscle, uh, lactic acid in your muscles, your brain builds up a bunch of trash during the day when you're thinking really hard and during sleep, you're, you're basically clearing out all the trash. So if you don't sleep, you're probably not clearing out all the trash and it's probably really bad for you. Um, and then the other thing I know is um, there's evidence, so there's a specific part of your brain called the hippocampus. It's this little seahorse bit in the center. Um, it's kind of the way station for memory. It um, is the first thing that absorbs new memories and then stores them out in your neocortex and the, the outside of your brain. Um, and that part is like the first bit that shuts down when you don't sleep. So people who are trying to pull all-nighters, they're like working really hard to memorize, you're actually like shutting down the bit of your brain that would help you memorize. So you do much better if you're trying to study for a test if you study for a bit and then go to bed um, than if you stay up all night because you're actually like shutting down that pathway. So those are the two things I know like offhand. Okay, last question. Well, um, I wanted to hear um, about your science communication um, career. Sure. Um, like, what are you doing and why did you decide to do it and how do you hope to combine that with presumably, I don't know, your future academic career? Yeah, um, so I'm really into science communication, so I get to do fun talks like this. Um, like I said, I have a podcast. I have written a couple of stories, both on my sleep research and on um, totally unrelated research. I got, I wrote a story about bees in Cuba for NPR because I got really interested in bees for a month or two. Um, so I really love doing all the science communication because I think when science only exists in academic journals that maybe three other people read, like that's not useful for anyone. It's not good for the field because not enough people are discussing the ideas. It's certainly not good for the public um, where you get all these wacky ideas about sleep that get put in the pop culture. Um, so I'm really into it. I am hopefully getting my PhD in the next year or so. Um, I, I showed you my proposal work, which is all the paintings. Um, ideally, I'd really like to get a career in science communication, whether that be science journalism, um, working at a museum and helping design outreach programs. Um, I want to be the Neil deGrasse Tyson of neuroscience, so <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll see where, where I can get a job. Great, thank you.